All right. You ready? Pontius Pilate, on Good Friday morning, asked Jesus a rhetorical question. What is truth? What is truth? The reason it's rhetorical is because Jesus had already said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. He said to Pilate, you say that I'm a king? Well said, for I am here to bear witness to the truth of my father. And so Pilate, in response, perhaps a wee bit cynical, frustrated, I don't think he liked being in Judea. I don't think he liked his position. I don't think he liked his future or was worried about it being under Caesar, and so a bit exasperated with this whole thing, this Jesus causing all these problems, he goes, what is truth? What is truth? I was playing golf years ago, having lunch with a group of guys, and this one fellow, his name's Eddie, became a friend, wealthy man, bit of an alcoholic, unhappy in his marriage. Somebody said something about truth and I was eavesdropping and he, he just blurted out to nobody in particular, what is truth? I was sitting fairly close to Eddie and I leaned over, I go, I know what truth is. And I found it. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor, I wish someday I could say that. So I pressed in a little bit, not trying to embarrass him in front of friends, because now everybody's listening. And I said, Eddie, you can find it today. His name is Jesus Christ. And he didn't laugh or mock. He just kind of shook his head and had three or four more cocktails and staggered home. I always wondered what happened to him. He moved away. I think about him. I think about him. I wonder if he ever, ever, I hope I planted a seed that truth can be found if you seek him who is truth. Let's go back to Proverbs 29, 18, where we were a couple of weeks ago before I went on my tour. The King James Version says this, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, we could say truth. Where there is no truth, the people perish. But he that keeps the law or the word of God, happy is he, happy is she. The New King James, which I usually use, version, where there is no revelation truth, the people cast off restraint. But again, happy is he or she who keeps the word of the Lord. Here's a few synonyms. I got up, as I said, I got up at about 1.30 this morning thinking it was breakfast time. I'm, I'm all messed up. Israel's 10 hours ahead of us, and Italy's nine hours ahead of us, so I'm still on that clock. And so I began to do just a little more research on this morning's short message. Here's some, here's some interesting synonyms for truth. Accuracy, authenticity, certainty, that which is correct, that which is certain, of course, that which is factual. Listen to this. Truth conforms and affirms reality and or logic. If truth certainly exists, which is an interesting question for church people, but you go to any university, you go, you go to a, a lot of different places, institutions, gatherings, and ask them what truth is, they'll laugh. They'll laugh at you. Because we live in a day of relativism, subjectivity, not objectivity. Let me get to that in just a moment. A few things I wrote down. If truth really exists, then it can be found. If it doesn't, then it can't. Amen. 
Pontius Pilate doubted there was absolute truth. Of course, living in his culture, his society, you can understand why. Here's a true statement. I want you to marinate this. Something cannot bring itself into existence. Or, creation did not create itself. And that's the truth. Here's another fact. Truth does not have to be reasonable or fair. As I said earlier, we live in a we live in an age of relativism. What is relativism? You've heard the word before, and most of you know the definition, but I wanted to look it up again. All points are equally valid, and all truth is relative to the individual. This is in relationship to culture, religions, or historical context. In other words, no absolutes. It's what you believe is your truth. Another word is perception. Situation ethics, morality, philosophy. I want you to look with me at Colossians 2. This will be our first scripture this morning. And let's look at Colossians 2, verse 8. We'll read on down to verse 10. Paul is talking. Now remember, most of the churches, I mentioned the Greece tour coming up next year. Most of the churches Paul started were in Hellenistic, Roman, Greek cultural places of uh, pantheism, many, many different gods, many different philosophies. Remember on Mars Hill, everybody's arguing philosophy and everybody's arguing this and that in the book of Acts. And these were, the, these were the regions or the cities, if you will, that Paul penetrated with the gospel of Christ. So he was up against some of the things we just discussed. Let's go to verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. Yeah. Empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to truth or Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of truth, if you will, the Godhead, the Trinity bodily. And you are complete. This is true, folks. You are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and all power. Somebody say amen to that or I'm gonna amen myself. A few days ago, a week ago or so, I was in Shiloh. Now, I've been to Israel 11, 12 times, and we've never been to Shiloh. I was excited to go see something brand new. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was after, after Joshua. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was for 369 years. It's the I didn't realize this, but Adam said, Dad, he goes, uh, the ark was at Shiloh longer than any other place in, in the history of our Jewish friends. Remember in 1 Samuel, let's go to that. Let's just back up to 1 Samuel where we were a couple of weeks ago. 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1. Now the boy Samuel, remember the story, ministered to the Lord before Eli, one of the last judges, before Samuel, and the word of the Lord was rare. Maybe your Bible says precious. The word of the Lord was rare or preciously rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation. There was no truth, and we discussed this a little bit. Why? Well, because there was sin in the temple. There was sin in the camp. Eli had two wicked sons who were priests, Hophni and Phinehas. They were doing unspeakable things with women, maybe even men, in the temple. They were introducing idolatry. And so the people over the years grew extremely nonchalant to the things of God. Let me show you a little history up here uh, of about 1,200 years from Moses to Christ. Put that up. Just a quick overview, family. Moses and then, of course, Joshua. Then after Joshua, we had a period of time of judges. From Othniel to Samuel, 15 judges. One was a woman. What was her name? Deborah, yeah. 
Gideon, Samson, very interesting, very interesting characters to study. Now, after the season of Judges, of course, we had the time of the kings from Saul, David, Solomon, and then things went south because of Solomon's sin. Remember, he, he bowed his knee to Rimon, the demon god. Solomon, Solomon had a problem with women. Solomon loved Persian women, and he loved them so much, some of them talked him into worshiping idols. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. And even though God didn't take the kingdom from Solomon because of David, his sons, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, now the, now the nation is split. Israel in the north, Judah in the south, for many, many, many years. And so there were a total of 42 kings, and most of them were wicked. Oh, there was a few. And we'll talk about one in particular. I believe if, if, if my memory serves me well, <laughs> even though I'm a little jet-lagged, that the northern kingdom of Israel, they were all wicked, like Ahab. Ahab, Jezebel, but, but the southern kingdom of Judah had a few, a few good, righteous kings. Now, after the time of the kings, around 63 BCE, Rome, I think it was, uh, not, I'll think of his name in just a minute, Pompey, one of those guys, uh, captured Jerusalem and the land, and of course, for hundreds of years, it was under Roman rule, and then our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is born. Now, during this 1,200-year period, there were many wars, captivities, uh, internal turmoil from the time of the judges right on through the time of the kings. It got so bad that the last book in the Bible is called what? What's it called? No, the, excuse me. You're right. Last book of the Old Testament is called. I told you I got jet lag. Work with me here. What's the last book of the Old Testament? Malachi. I just got back from Italy. It's called Malachi. No, it's Malachi. It's Malachi. It got so bad that, remember, God said, return to me. How many times? Return to me. Why? Return to me with this. Return to me with your worship. Return to me with your heart. And they go, We're, we haven't gone anywhere. We're right here. Return to me with the tithe. They go, the what? The tithe. What's that? Remember the tithe? If you, if you come back to me, I'll open the windows of heaven. I'll forgive you. I'll bless you. Obviously, they didn't. Because for the next 400 years, no revelation, no vision, and it cost them. It cost them because God said, I'll visit you with a curse. Either, either bring a blessing and be a blessing or you'll be a curse and live a curse. And of course, Rome came and that went on, of course, for centuries. All right. One of the rare, very rare Good Kings was a young, young man named Josiah. Let's quickly go to 2 Kings 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. You know a nation's in trouble when an eight-year-old becomes king. Makes me praying for this election we have coming, but whatever. That's another story. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And he did, watch, he did what was right in the sight of God and walked in the ways of his father David. Interesting. He did not turn to the right or to the left. We're speaking about doctrine, his belief, which is interesting. And I'll get to that in just a moment because he didn't know a whole lot about God. This is an amazing story, and I'm going to, I'm going to go as fast as I can for sake of time, of this young reformer who brought one of the great revivals to Israel because he was a seeker of truth. Even though he didn't know what it was, scripturally speaking. Now, what amazes me, as I said, or what is striking is his father and grandfather were two of the most wicked, evil kings in the history of Judah. Manasseh 
and his son, Ammon, father, grandfather. They introduced idolatry back into the land. This is after a good king, Hezekiah. They were so evil, what they did is simply called abominations. Again, even inside the temple, they set up idols inside the house of God. And some of the things they did were too gross. They, sac they let babies be sacrificed to Moloch. Like if I sacrifice this child, my crops will grow. And you know that there's a place called Gehenna, which is the type of hell outside of the gates, where they would play drums real loud to silence the screams of the babies being burned to death, being burned alive. Now, don't get mad at me, but this is a precursor to abortion. This is an Old Testament. If you know how babies are aborted, you'll understand the, the analogy there. And please, if you've had an abortion, you're forgiven. It's under the blood. Go and sin no more, all right? But they would sacrifice their children so that their life would be better, just like a woman who doesn't want the responsibility. And I understand fear, and, and I understand there's a lot of reasons, none of them good, but there's a lot of reasons that seem good why women will, will murder an unborn child. And this argument, that, this argument that a woman has the right over her own body, yes, she does. Absolutely, women have the right over their own body. But that's not their body. It's another body that has a right. Amen? And if you don't agree with me, I really don't care. All right, here we go. It's the truth. I don't have, I don't have to. You know, one thing, one thing I love about the truth, family, one thing I love about the truth is you don't have to defend it. It'll stand on its own merit. What we defend is a lie. Oh, I swear to God, I swear to God, it wasn't me, I swear to God. But we have you on video. Well, it looks like me. <laughs> All right, here we go. 1 Kings 13. Why, why am I going back 300 years? Here's an eight-year-old boy who becomes king because his wicked father died, thank God. How does an eight-year-old boy who's raised by, well, let me back up. Obviously, he wasn't raised by his father. Or maybe he would have turned to the dark side. But scholars think he was raised by tutors that kind of clandestine, if you will, secretly began to share the history of God. Not through a Bible, because there were no Bibles. I'll get to that in just a moment. Why were there no Bibles I'll share that with you. It's fascinating. But let's go back, let's go back 300 years to an amazing prophecy. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam, wicked Jeroboam, son of Solomon, stood by the altar, altar, okay, to burn incense. Then the prophet cried out against the altar. Why would a prophet of God cry out against an altar? Because it's a golden calf. Read chapter 12. It's a golden calf, just like, just like Moses and the problem they had in the wilderness. And so the, the prophet cries out, Altar, O altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priest and the high places who burn incense on you. And men's bones shall be burned on you. And it goes on and on and on. And, and Jeroboam is so mad, you jump down there, he says, arrest him. Then as his hand, he was pointing, arrest this prophet. His hand turned leprous, withered up, and the altar split apart, and ashes poured out of the altar according to the prophecy of the man of God. 300 years, family, 300 years before Josiah is born, his name's in the Bible. A young boy will be born. Ah, download that. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Let's go back now to 2 Kings, to the story of Josiah. Now it came to pass, 22, 2 Kings 22, verse 3. And it came to pass in the 18th year. So how old is he now? He's 26. 
He's 26 years old. It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the scribe, the son of the son of the son of the, you know, Bible goes. Verse four, go up to Hilkiah, the priest, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, watch now, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house. They're having a heart for the house campaign. Just like we are. We gotta, we, there's things we gotta fix in this church and thank God we're doing it and thank you for being so generous. There, what happened was because the people were so backslid, nobody was going to the temple anymore except to do wicked, evil things, sexually speaking and otherwise, that the how, weeds were growing, it was crumbling, and Josiah, who had a heart for God, not based on knowledge or information, but he just had a heart for God, just like a lot of you did before you started reading the Bible. There was something in your heart that made you want to seek the Lord. Amen. That's my story. And as Josiah began to, to see how run down the church was, the temple, he said, let's have a project. Let's fix this, let's fix this place up. And so that's what's going on. They're having, they're having a heart for the house. So there's carpenters and builders and masons, and they're buying timber and stone to repair the house. Verse 7, however, there need not be any accounting because he trusted them. Now watch. As they're doing house cleaning, getting all the stuff out to get the new stuff in. Verse 8, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, I have found a Bible. I have found the book of the law, a Bible, an Old Testament Bible, not the whole thing, but a part of it. I found it. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. You see, under the wicked reign of Manasseh and Ammon, they destroyed every Bible. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And because they didn't want anybody to read God's will and God's word, they wanted to worship idols and do their thing. They thought they had destroyed every book of the law, the books of Moses and other books. Maybe some of the Psalms of David. We're not quite sure, but it was a portion of the Bible up to the time of Hezekiah who was the great-grandfather of this young Josiah. Are you following me? You tracking with me a little bit here? All right, let's read on. Verse 10. So Shaphan shows it to the king, who had never seen a Bible before. And he says, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. <laughs> and Shaphan read it before the king. Read what? The whole thing. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1. He read right on through. Can you imagine? This is the first time this little king, now 26, is hearing God's word and God's will. And when he heard it, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, and a bunch of others, verse 13, go inquire of the Lord quickly for the people and all of Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers, especially his, have not obeyed the words in this book. So do so according to all that is written concerning us. Can you imagine when he gets to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy and God says, if you do this, I'll bless you. But if you turn to other gods, turn to idols, I will destroy you. Can you imagine the fear that gripped Josiah, when all around him is idol worship, human baby sacrifice. See, Hilkiah was, excuse me, Josiah was like a lot of politicians today. Even though they may know right, they let people do wrong. Even though maybe their conscience is somewhat violated, well, it's the will of the people. The people want this, the people want that. 
We're going to let this marriage. We're going to have bathrooms for everybody. It's well, it's the will of the people. It's the will of the people, even though I don't agree with it. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I to stop it? Who am I to stop? That was Josiah. He was he was probably somewhat tormented because in his heart, he really wanted to do God's will, but he had no word. He had no Bible to guide him. He had no standard to live by, but he had a heart. It could be, it could be what he saw his father and grandfather do turned his stomach. And what he saw other people doing, sacrificing babies. Well, my my father allowed it. My grandfather allowed it. I I guess for some people it's okay. But I would never do that. But I have to be the king of all the people, so I guess I have to let the people do some things that they think is truth. Now, all of a sudden, for the first time, he's reading a Bible. Oh, my God. What have I allowed? These people are going to bring the wrath of God on us if I don't stop this. Now, watch. As the scribe kept reading the Bible, what would you do if you saw your name in the Bible the first time you read it? I imagine the gentleman reading the Bible kind of looked at the king. <clears throat> now, king, we're going to go to 1 Kings 13. <clears throat> you better sit down. <laughs> Why? You better sit down. A young man. Josiah by name of the house of David. Can you imagine? If the first time, Matt, you opened a Bible and you saw yourself in it. But you know the truth, ladies and gentlemen? We're all in the Bible. Whosoever is you soever is me soever. And if you read the rest of the story, which we don't have time to get into, but it's beautiful. He does exactly what the prophecy 300 years ago said. He had all the false prophets killed, the priests killed. He knocked down all the altars. He cleansed the nation. And for many, many, many years, there was one of the greatest revivals in the history of Judah, which even spilled up north a little bit into Israel. Why? Why? Because here's a man who decided to live by the word of God. Stand up with me, please. What is truth, Pilate asked. What is truth? I live in a subjective world. I live in a world where there's many gods and there's many philosophies. I work for a dictator, a tyrant, and you call yourself a king, you call yourself truth. (laughs) You're just a, I know my wife had a dream about you, but I find no, remember what Pilate said. In fact, we're gonna see the movie Risen in a couple of weeks, Friday night. You gotta see this movie. It's about an unbeliever. What is truth? This is being debated in every university, every coffee house. People write all kinds of books about what they think is right and what they think is wrong. You know what what gets me about America is people think because a law is passed, it's right. We live in a nation, well, I have the right. I have the right to marry. I have the right to have an abortion. I have the right to do this. Listen, truth doesn't mean something's right. There's many laws we have in this country that are absolutely wrong according to my definition of truth. I don't know what your definition of truth is. I've read you a bunch of them. My definition of truth is this. Whatever God thinks, whatever God says, whatever he had written is truth. That's true.
You want to live in a subjective world? You want to stay with relativism? Most of the world is, you know. Well, you know, all roads lead to heaven. Well, Jesus is one of three things. A lunatic, a liar, or Lord. As for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. Once I found the truth, <laughs> all my perception, my relativism, my subjectivity, my situational ethics, which means whatever situation I was in, the truth was I tried to get out of it or get in it. If it felt good, do it. I ain't hurting nobody. Then for the first time I read the word of the Lord. And now even though I am far from perfect on my best day, I don't know if I've had my best day yet. On my best day, I am still flawed. And I will be until I step out of this body. Because we war, not just with the world and the devil, but our flesh. So I make mistakes, but the truth is I know what to do about them. I sin, but the truth is I know how to get forgiveness. That's the truth. I found the truth February the 10th, 1977. I've been studying the truth ever since. I've been doing my best to live up to it. I fall short. But I used to fall backwards. Now I fall into the arms of God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In reverence of him and in courtesy to your neighbor. What's your truth? What is your truth? Isaiah said there's a highway to hell and there's a highway to holiness. What road do you want? A good friend of mine, Dr. Jack Deere, said there's two paths, the path of pleasure and flesh, then there's the path of responsibility and righteousness. Which path are you on? Where are you going? Because if you don't know where you're going, I'm gonna tell you where you're gonna end up. I will tell you where you're gonna end up if you don't know where you're going, because it's already predestined. Heaven's gonna be very lonely if I don't see you there. I'm going to wonder why. Because you heard me tell you the truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. And if you want to get to heaven and to my father, you have to go through this door. The Christ. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Why would you put off eternity when it's right before you today? It's here. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. God is stretching forth his hand. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters. Put your life in the hands of God and find out what life is all about. Find out what true joy and peace and how to handle problems and challenges. While your heads are bowed and your eyes closed, if, if you're ready for the truth, if you're ready to say, Jesus, I'm ready. If you're ready to invite the Son of God into your life, if you're ready to RSVP, your place in heaven, lift your hand real quick. Don't think about it, just do it. Lift your hand real quick. Lift your hand all over the place. Hands, the balcony, hands. You're standing next to somebody that didn't lift their hand and you're praying right now that they should have. You know who I'm talking to. 
would you please reach over quietly, tenderly, and squeeze their hand and say, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. Please give your life to Christ today. One more time, would you lift your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look this way, everybody. I'm not going to pray for somebody. I'm going to pray for everybody. The Bible says, he or she who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word there is sozo. Oh, it's a beautiful word. It's a great word in the Greek, one of my favorite words. It means healed, delivered, blessed, prosperous, happy. It has such a wide application. It means all your sins are forgiven. Past sins, today's sins, tomorrow's sins. When Jesus died on the cross, as Dr. Huggins presented, he died for every sin every person would commit forever. As, as long as there is planet Earth, Jesus already paid for all your sins. That's a good deal. What a deal. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Righteousness is a gift. You don't earn it, it's a gift. Heaven's a gift. You don't earn it, it's a gift. You want to do good works? I hope you do. Do it. But you don't have to earn your salvation. You work because of your salvation. Amen. All right, everybody, let's pray. Let's all pray. I was baptized in the river. I've been baptized in the river Jordan. My hair's still wet. I've been baptized so many times in the river Jordan. Every time I go to the river Jordan, I get baptized again. I just want those holy waters. I, I know they're not holy, but to me it's holy. Waters to flow over me. You just feel, you feel so good coming out of that water. I love, I love telling Jesus the sinner's prayer again. I don't have to. I just like it. My wife, the other day, she goes, why don't you ever tell me you love me? I said, I told you that the day we got married. Wasn't that enough? I'm joking. But you get it. You get it. Just because you said the sinner's prayer 30 years ago, it's okay to say it again. Especially as we're saying it together as a family. You ready? Father in heaven. Come on. Father in heaven. This day is my day of salvation. I believe with all my heart. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the way. And he's the life.